You're listening to Let's Talk Creation, the science podcast that's just for you. It might not be Angel Human or Seth Kane, uh, you know, that yeah. produced those post-flood Nephilim. It could be something else, and that word is just used to describe whatever they are. So, Yeah. Very interesting. All right. Should we do one more question for you? Yeah, why not? Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, I get this one. <laughs> I get this all the time. Hey, if the Earth is thousands of years old, then how do you explain carbon dating? Oh, those millions of year old fossils and stuff. <laughs> okay. Oh my, yeah. That was always painful to hear. Because uh, I don't know where to begin, yeah. but anyway, I'll let you try it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, where where do we want to begin? Well, the, the, the place I want to begin is to point out the misperception that is kind of embedded in the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is the idea that carbon dating is somehow used to establish that the world and the fossils are millions of years old. Right. Um, which um, it is not. Right. Um, uh, and there are two reasons why carbon dating is not used in that way. Um, one is that carbon dating um, can only be applied to samples that contain organic carbon. Um, so we're talking about samples such as shell or wood or bone. Mm -hmm. And that excludes most rocks. So if you're wanting okay. to date, um, you know, a basalt lava or a volcanic ash deposit, you are not going to be using carbon dating. You're going to have nope. to use some other kind of radiometric method. So that's the first thing. But the second thing, and perhaps, you know, even, even more important, is that radioactive carbon, carbon-14, has a short half-life of only 5,730 years. Now, we discussed the concept of half-life in did. our recent um, introduction to geological dating. Right. Episode. So if you want to sort of go back and uh, have a look at that, that will explain in a bit more detail what a, a half-life is. But it's basically the time that it takes for half of any given amount of radioactive material to decay into its stable daughter product. So that's basically what a half-life is. And Radioactive carbon, carbon-14, has this relatively short half-life. Um, and given that uh, you know, after about 10 half-lives or so, there is no measurable amount of the original material left in the sample to measure, okay. that effectively limits the um, useful lifespan of radioactive carbon to somewhere between about fifty and 60,000 years or so, depending uh. on the sensitivity of the particular instrument that you're using to measure the radioactive carbon in the sample. Um, that's not so very for both old of those, at all on the, on the conventional that's not very uh, old. scheme. Yeah. No, so exactly. So, so if you find um, carbon-14 in a fossil sample, a measurable amount, then that is evidence that, that sample is actually geologically quite young. Um, it is not evidence that it is millions of years old. Okay. Um. So that's kind of the first thing, you know, we, we've, we, we could kind of deal with that um, misperception. Right. But having said all of that, can we say something more about radiocarbon and how it is used and what it can tell us and what perhaps what some of its limitations are? Um, so let, let's kind of go back to brass tacks then. So let's think about how is radioactive carbon, carbon-14, formed? Well, it's formed... Um, continually in the Earth's upper atmosphere. Cosmic rays bombard the Earth's atmosphere, okay. and those cosmic rays produce subatomic particles called neutrons. And those neutrons collide with uh, nitrogen atoms, nitrogen-14, in the atmosphere, converting those nitrogen-14 atoms to carbon-14. Uh, those carbon atoms then combine with oxygen to form carbon dioxide, CO2. Okay. And, of course, carbon dioxide gets taken up by plants. Mm -hmm. Okay, So they take up the, the CO2. And then animals eat the plants 
And in this way, the radioactive carbon, along with a whole lot of normal carbon, carbon-12, gets incorporated into the food chain, um, into the biosphere, the bodies okay. of living things. And while organisms are alive, um, they continually ingest more carbon-14. Okay, They continually take on more carbon-14, replacing any carbon-14 that is lost by radioactive decay because the carbon-14 decays because it's unstable. It decays back to nitrogen-14. But while the organism's alive, it keeps taking in more carbon-14 that ultimately is coming from the upper atmosphere. All right. But when the organism dies, so the you know the plant or the animal dies, it stops ingesting carbon-14, right? True. S but the carbon-14 continues to decay into nitrogen-14. And so, in effect, we can take a fossil sample, a sample of wood or shell or bone, and by measuring the amount of radiocarbon in that sample, knowing the original proportion of carbon-14 to ordinary carbon, carbon-12, we can use that as a kind of clock to work out or to estimate the age of the fossil sample. Um, so that's basically how carbon-14 works. Right. But the, the thing I suppose to notice is that we have made some crucial assumptions when we try to estimate the age of materials using carbon-14. For example, we we have to assume that the production rate of carbon-14 that we measure today has always been the same in, in the past. Uh, or if it hasn't, then you know we've, we've got to take that into account, right? If the production rate of carbon-14 has changed, uh, we need to know about that because it's going to have an impact on you know, how, how we then estimate our date. Uh, we have to assume that the atmosphere um, has the same amount of carbon-14 in it um, in the past as today. And we have to assume that the biosphere has always had the same proportion of radioactive carbon to normal carbon mm -hmm. as we measure today. So if you look in animals today i think it's one radioactive carbon atom for every trillion carbon 12 something like that and so you know we have to assume that that's basically been the same in the past um but in fact those assumptions aren't strictly correct um we know that they're not strictly correct uh for example we know that carbon 14 concentrations even in in the modern world um, vary by latitude and through time and according to sunspot activity and things of this kind. Huh. So quite often radiocarbon dates have to be recalibrated to take into account these complicating factors in order to ensure that your date is accurate. And in fact, in the creationist model, there are even bigger potential complicating factors. Probably the biggest is the worldwide flood which we've talked about earlier in this episode. Um, at the time of the flood, it looks as if an enormous amount of carbon from the biosphere was buried in the fossil record. So a huge amount of carbon was kind of taken out of the biosphere and uh, it was preserved in the geological record as coal and oil and limestones and other fossil materials. And so... The world before the flood, if that's correct, the world before the flood had a huge amount more carbon in it than the modern biosphere, perhaps 200 times as much. What that means uh, is that any carbon-14 produced in the atmosphere would have been diluted by much more normal carbon, right. non-radioactive carbon. Right. Um, and that would mean that the proportion of carbon-14 to carbon-12 in those samples would not be the same as the proportion in modern samples. Uh, and it would mean that those fossil materials formed at the time of the flood would actually give ages that were erroneously old. Right. 
they would be too large yeah. because we haven't taken into account, you know, this different proportion of C14 to C12. So in the creationist model, um, you know, we, we have added complications, you know, even beyond the ones that we already kind of know about, you know, in conventional um, interpretations of radiocarbon dating. And it means that we also need to have ways of recalibrating carbon dates to take that into account. And that's a huge area of ongoing research. Exactly how do we recalibrate those radiocarbon dates so that they give us real biblical time, right. you know, real time rather than um, an erroneously old radiocarbon age because of the uniformitarian assumptions that are traditionally made within the carbon-14 method. Right, right. All right. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So basically, we have reason to believe in the creation model that things that lived close to the time of the flood would have looked already older by radiometric means than they really were. Yeah. So that by the time we get their remains today, yeah, they look super old, even though they're not that old. I think carbon dating is one of those um, dating methods that creationists have a pretty good handle on, honestly. The other, the other methods, sort of the, the, say the uranium methods or something like that, those are, those are, I think, more difficult. But carbon dating, I think we got a pretty good, pretty good model. It all sort of fits together with what we know about the flood and so forth. So, I kind of like it when people ask me about carbon dating. <laughs> <laughs> so you just heard a clip from the Let's Talk Creation podcast. If you'd like to learn more about the podcast or hear the full episode, check out corsi.org slash podcast or hit the notification bell, hit subscribe, hit like, and you will see our podcast episodes on your regular video feed. Thanks. <laughs>